Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Good Harbor Beach uh, and its ecosystem webinar this evening. We're focusing on adaptation. Um, we're pleased to have a really fantastic panel with us tonight. And um, I'm going to be your moderator, I'm Mari Nailward. Uh, let's just go over the outline uh, as we get started. And um, we are going to begin the, this evening with a series of informative presentations. And the first one is going to be by Denton Cruz of the Friends of Good Harbor. And he's going to be joined by Barbara Warren from Salem Sound Coast Watch. Uh, they'll be followed by Jane Knott from Hydro Predictions about she's going to address infrastructure issues at coastal roads, um, specifically Thatcher Road. And we will hear from Harvard professor Charles Waldheim and Harvard lecturer Kira Klingen, who will provide examples of adaptation solutions. A panel of the speakers will begin the Q&A segment, for which we have allotted about 50 minutes this evening. And so please think of questions that you would like to ask the panel or things that you would like to ask in general and place them into the chat. I will try my best to get to all of your questions this evening. Um, so if everybody's ready with our uh, panel um, and our speakers, we'll just get right to it. Um, Denton and Barbara, I'm going to introduce, um, oh, sorry. Um, I wanted to talk about the Good Harbor field trip. Thank you, Jane. So the Good Harbor field trip that will follow this particular webinar will be on January 23rd from 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Um, it will take place at an astronomical high tide and uh, you'll be able to get a chance to see what Good Harbor Beach and the surrounding ecosystem look like um, at, that, at that high tide. Uh, it will be um, rain or shine. So please make sure that you wear appropriate boots and clothes uh, for that uh, time of year. But we look forward to seeing you in January. Um, and I'll just introduce Denton and Barbara right now. So Denton Cruz is the founder of De the Development Institute, a consulting firm in Boston devoted to applying constructive management and development processes to the opportunities and challenges of institutions of higher education. And this includes schools, nonprofits, national associations, and higher education tech firms. From 1980 to 2010, he served as advisors to presidents, chancellors, and CEOs with numerous project assignments in the US related to management and change, as well as international projects. Denton has been the Dean and Professor of Management in the Graduate School of Lesley University, that's in Cambridge, and the Executive Director for Action Inc., a community action agency in Gloucester. Among his volunteer activities, Denton was the president of the Friends of Good Harbor in Gloucester and Old Nugent Farm Community Con Condominium Association in Gloucester. Thank you so much, Denton, for joining us tonight. I'm going to also introduce Barbara Warren, who is the Executive Director from Salem Sound Coast Watch. Uh, Barbara is the executive director, uh, a regional environmental nonprofit is Salem Sound Coast Watch. She's the lower north regional coordinator for the Mass Bay National Estuary Partnership. Barbara has developed and implemented many citizen science programs, including salt marsh assessment, marine invasive species monitoring, and the Adopt a Beach program. She has focused much of her energy on climate awareness and coastal resilience projects, and currently works on climate adaptation actions with Marblehead, Manchester, Beverly, and Salem. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Barbara and Denton, and we're really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Can I hear you heard? Yes. Can you see? Okay, good. And thank you, Town Green. Uh, thank you for leading the way on climate change on the Good Harbor pilot, which is a wonderful thing, and for doing these three webinars. A thankless position, but done very, very well. As you know, uh, we made a presentation at the first workshop with all of the studies that have been done of the Good Harbor Marsh and Beach and what the friends have done. So tonight, we will be talking, both Barbara Walk, Warren and I, about the topic of Good Harbor adaptations, that is adaptations to 
coming climate changes and also coastal adaptations, adaptation to climate changes. In other words, the North Shore. And you'll see in this particular slide that we slightly altered, I hope you'll forgive us, um, Maureen, the topic from adaptation, is it possible to what is possible? That was at the suggestion of Barbara because of her firm belief that all things are possible, which she has just demonstrated. More about that later. Next. Next. Sorry, right there. Um, now, I want to begin by calling everybody's attention to the latest study and plan of the city of Gloucester, Climate Action Resilience Plan. That's what CARP stands for. And it's a comprehensive assessment of the implications of climate change and also a plan for it. And it identifies, it's a long report, it was put out in January, and it, it enumerates things to be done in the following vulnerable areas, the neighborhoods of Gloucester, the ecosystems of Gloucester, the buildings of Gloucester and the roads of Gloucester and the overall resources of Gloucester. Next. In that report, the very first page has Mayor Berger's opening statement. I'll read you the first and last sentence. Climate change is here. There, he said it. And the last sentence, that the purpose of the plan is to solidify the commitment, key word, to taking climate action. That surely is our call to action. Next. In that report, I will just highlight these points as of special interest to what we're doing tonight on climate change and adaptations. And particularly, this will be the emphasis, at least in this first segment, nature-based solutions. Not the roads and buildings so much, but nature-based solutions. Interestingly, it's stated right in the CARP that in a survey, and there was lots of community involvement in the preparation of that report. It's on the website of the city of Gloucester. The survey showed that 70% of the respondents said the highest priority of all those vulnerability areas that I mentioned before is to protect natural resources and increased open space. That's what the citizens of Gloucester said. And that was the highest ranked response category. Everything else was around 50%. I find that very significant. And then I thought it would be useful to mention three of the strategies that are scattered in the report. Identify strategies to preserve and protect the natural systems and waterways, and they have some details. So it's responsive to what the citizens are calling for. Community education and engagement, that's responsive because they need to know more and they need to get engaged. And then preserve the salt marshes and eliminate impairments. And they've mentioned two at Good Harbor there. That will be referenced a little bit later. Next. Now, quickly, I would like to just highlight what we already said at workshop number one, just so we have that momentum going into our presentation. The topic then was the past and present conditions of a good harbor ecosystem. That was on October 26th. Next. Here we see the assessments that have been done. The Friends of Good Harbor was engaged in a number of them. Sail and Sound Coast Watch was also, but other parties as well. Sail and Sound Coast Watch in the, in the first four on the left were all in the first decade of the 2000s. The four on the right are all in the second decade of the 2000s. So you can see there is a sort of a steady assessment going on. And Salem Sound started one in co-op one, it's gotten in, in option one and obtained baseline data. Uh, in the second report, the Audubon Society 
uh, did a, a one about rivers and streams, and there were nine sites in the Good Harbor area that were identified there. The third, the, the Coastal Zone Management uh, funded report, identified multiple Good Harbor needs. And in the fourth, the Massachusetts Division of Ecological Restoration identified eight sites of good in, on Good Harbor in need. And the fifth one is a little different. A presentation was made in City Hall by Conservation Commission identifying dunes as in need of attention. And they have to be talking about Good Harbor Beach and a place for them to move to, to migrate to as climate change occurs and to be cared for and protected. So I cite that here, as it's not the fog study, but it's relevant that the Conservation Commission is on record as is the city of Gloucester with regard to dune protection. And in the sixth one, Salem Sound Coast Watch does multiple recommendations there as well as the seventh, adding sea level rise as an issue. And finally, number eight, which is the CARP report that I mentioned here before, I won't mention it again, next. Over these 20 years, we have seen similarities in these recommendations and themes. And here is an attempt to extract the themes, stressors, stormwater runoff, invasive vegetation, intrusions, development of marsh for with buildings and so forth, and build and beach and dune management, failures, sometimes successes, tidal creek pollution, we all know the incident recently there, and impaired conditions for the marsh and culverts, the seawater flow uh, in its natural state and, and salinity conditions, and of course, how it is affected fish spawning and nursery habitat, which it is. So what you can see from this is that there are real issues to address, but the overall impression that we have from uh, these reports is the following. It's kind of two pronged. First, the Good Harbor ecosystem is splendidly complex and multifaceted with numerous interlocked interrelated components. That's, that's its totality, ecosystem. This also, this complexity also makes it fragile and vulnerable and difficult to decide what to do. And that's why we use words like protection and preservation. Next. So with this background, I want to close with an appeal. You can see the various parties that are necessary if Good Harbor is to be a pilot in order to make something successful, to make something happen. It's Good Harbor has been chosen as a pilot site for resilience to climate change on Cape Ann. First one, what an opportunity this is and what a timely moment it is because these webinars are drawing the attention of the community to consider the effects of climate change. And I hope to consider involvement, engagement, and participation. And so my appeal to all of you is to sign on to this challenge, not just register for the seminars, the third one on implementation is coming up in January, but to become a citizen scientist or a citizen volunteer, because it's going to take that kind of work to convert these thoughts to what is necessary to implement. And it will require many partners and many hands. Next, and finally, I'd like to offer a final word of encouragement. This phrase that you see up there in the title, punctuated librium, uh, equilibrium, I first learned of it in reading Stephen Jay Gould's books, but it has to do with how things evolve and grow from a paleontologist point of view, based on two premises. One is that normally evolution and growth are steady and incremental, step by step, onward and upward. But periodically, 
the process is punctuated by events that leap forward. And you can see we are positing some leaps forward coming. And as a member of Friends of Good Harbor, I can attest that a local community can achieve these incremental steps because it's happened. You'll see along the, the uh, array there that we've done things like salt marsh studies and dunes protection and safety walkway and the people who do the piping plovers. And now the attempt to save Salt Island. These are good steps. But what we are being asked to do in, by Town Green and Harvard School of Design is I think to take some leaps forward with regard to punctuated equilibrium. And that would mean that we could, could we achieve in the next, let's just look at the period between now and 2038, the next eight years to 2030, can we achieve something significant in natural adaptation? And by 2038, can we achieve a measure of resilience, which will make a difference? I think we can, that would be, punctuated equilibrium now and in the days ahead. So next, I want to introduce now Barbara Warren, who is widely respected in North Shore in Massachusetts, friend of Fogs, friend of the Good Harbor, knowledgeable of the Good Harbor system with all of her studies. And I would say, along with Alison Fry, her associate, these are the Rachel Carsons, of our area. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Denton. <laughs> and thank you for that compliment. Um, next. So uh, maybe we'll come back to this slide. Uh, just look at it quickly. It uh, talks about near term adaptation options. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of these and then midterm or um, a little longer term. Uh, it's all these things uh, can be done, but they all need to be considered uh, carefully. Uh, the one thing that we notice in all of these is public education. Uh, we can't move forward unless the, the public understands and participates. Next. So the um, origins of the Good Harbor Marsh, uh, all our salt marshes in New England are post-glacial. And many of our marshes, most of them, except for the um, the shoreline marshes the, um, are, are formed behind barrier beaches, and that's what Good Harbor is. So the barrier beach is really critical for the marsh that's behind it. And the barrier beaches naturally want to move inland. Uh, they are not static. Sometimes they move forward, sometimes they, they'll move backwards. And with sea level rise, our barrier beaches are going to definitely be moving inland. And our salt marshes can follow they can also move inland if the upland is not too steep or there's no barriers to migration like um, homes, seawalls, and roads. Uh, next. So the dunes, I chose uh, dunes as our first strategy for adaptation because it, it is so critical to the salt marsh. And it is the, uh, that really dynamic um, interconnected to the whole. They're the first line of defense from coastal storms. I'm sure you all know that, and we'll see some pictures uh, in a minute. But um, what I wanted to say is that the Good Harbor Marsh is young, and it has a lot of sand. Um, the bottom picture on the right is upstream of Thatcher Road, and you can see that the, the lower, the left um, part of the photo is the cord grass, the tall uh, Spartina alternate flora that gets wet. Um, every tie, high tide, but up there, then we start this sort of little mini sand dune with a more um, uh, oh. border plant. And so you'll see that throughout the salt, the salt marsh, you'll see the sand. And I actually was walking with uh, somebody in the marsh from um, the, from the federal government, US Coast, uh, USGS, um, and he was really impressed. He liked the marsh, um, thought it was a wonderful ecosystem, but also how much sand was still there and how young it was. So move on, please. Next. So we all know of the damage that nor'easters do to us and and to our um, and to our ecosystem. So uh, the winter of 2013, you can see how the the, the dune was washed away, and then again. Um, 
these are wonderful photos from Kim Smith. And um, this was the, the March 2018 storm. I'm sure you all remember it. Um, and um, Phil is holding the marking on the on pole three where how much sand was washed away. This happened off of the whole coast, east coastline. Um, and um, I had heard from um, geologists that in this particular storm, the sand was taken way offshore. So they expected it, it would take longer for our, our dunes to restore. You can also see how wide this path is and what a clear shot. So next. So the first strategy is dune restoration, and you've already done it in Gloucester, you've already done it at Good Harbor, uh, but it's not something you can stop. This is something that we you need to continue doing, continue protecting those dunes, um, planting the beach grass, but also other things, other plants like goldenrod, sea rocket, some bayberry, beach plum. And we're already the bottom left photo, the stiff uh, leaf quackgrass, agropyrons, and in the creeping bentgrass, they're already in the system, in the marsh, where the, we, we're finding this sand. So the, the, the grasses and plants are in the system. We just need to add that to the, um, the dunes that exist. And the two pictures on the right show a, um, a, a, an effort that was conducted um, on 10 miles from uh, New Newberry up through two towns in New Hampshire, and they had over a thousand volunteers and um, in those five towns planting uh, salt marsh, I mean uh, dune grasses, and so it's it's always a great way to get the, the community involved. Mm -hmm. But it's not something you do once. You know, every time, like we just had a storm, maybe we'll need to do it again, and and through that, educating people how important it is. The two professors there, um, Dave Burdick and Greg Moore, I've worked with them, uh, great people. Uh, their part as I am and Allison as, of the Salt Marsh Working Group. And so there are coast salt marsh um, professionals, academics who are coming together, uh, working on how we can save our salt marshes with climate change. And so I'm gonna propose that uh, maybe uh, we talk about having a forum or something just on um, the salt marsh, mm -hmm. but in person. So we actually get the scientists and Salem Town Coast Watch walking out and um, looking at the marsh in, in totality uh, before we start saying, oh, we need to do this or that. We really need to study it. So next. And so this bringing back in what Denton was saying, this dune restoration is a perfect uh, way to involve the community, the public sector, and there is funding for it, which is very important. Okay, next. Um, strategy two. Uh, you probably you're going to hear this over and over again about climate change um, that we it's not uniform across the of the earth the northeast is the hot spot our oceans are warming faster uh, already nine times faster than global average and our sea level rise is happening of three to four times um, uh, faster and that's all going to bring more chaotic weather for us um, like we had the drought and heat or then we get extreme precipitation events uh, and so we all have to be aware of that this is happening and we have to monitor the systems we care about so we can learn and know um, how they're being affected and start implementing adaptation. Next. So this is, um, you know, like I, we said that we have been actually I started. Uh, at Salem Sound Coast Watch as a volunteer in 2001 in the Good Harbor Marsh. Um, and then I became, uh, you know, started working with uh, Salem Sound. And we, I was, this is a photo from 2005. Um, I want you to look at the round thing in the front. That's a rock uh, right off of the, um, the, um, the parking lot as we go down into the marsh. And the bushes behind that, that's all a Ivo Futescence, it's a marsh elder, it's a high tide bush. So it's always at the border. Okay, next. We went back in 2012 when we were work, doing some work with the Friends of Good Harbor and uh, took this photo, wasn't even thinking about it at the time, and then got back and realized that's the same rock. And look at the difference in vegetation. So our mm -hmm. We only have like two marsh elder bushes in this particular um, photo. Uh, and then the rest is the, um, the high marsh uh, grass, the uh, Spartina patens. So that made us start thinking, we can document 
um, how our climate is changing um, the marsh um, just by looking by going out and doing this photo documentation. Next. So as I said that um, the Good Harbor Marsh is predominantly a high marsh, the um, sea salt marsh covered grass and the uh, spike grass. Next. And the tall cord grass, the Spartina alternate floor, is mainly at along a ditch or along the Saratoga Creek. So again, here's a photo from 2005. Next. When we be, went back in 2012, we were like, okay. whoa, we are in the same bend of the, of the creek. And you can see that the bank has collapsed. Mm -hmm. You can see the alternate floor is, you know, sort of struggling a little bit in that muddy, or it's not really muddy, it's a very sandy flat, but it's getting inundated and staying wetter. Um, so is this sea level rise or is this storm events? What is causing that? And that's what uh, led us to start um, looking at the width of the creek, the height of the bank, and we picked some other things that we're studying um, th that are uh, in addition to the vegetation for the um, to monitor sea level rise in a way that I individuals can join us and can learn and help do it. You don't need to, uh, expensive equipment um, to follow this. Next. Um, and then uh, Allison and I went back um, this fall, and um, lo and behold, we are seeing now we're in that in along the creek, and you see the alternate floor, the tall grass that's along the edge. But, but then we have this other plant. This is Sueda linearis. It's an early colonizer. So if the the uh, gr the ground the the plants the grass disappear in its muddy spots, the seeds will get started, and you will have this the Sueda. Um, it's a salt marsh plant. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's just not what we saw before. Uh, next. Okay. So we were like, oh, is this sea level rise? And then as we were looking for back through photos, we saw um, the 2017 photo uh, when we were doing one of our measurements out there. And those are all algal mats that have been washed in and then at a high tide and then settled down on the vegetation. So now the question is, what is a sea level rise? Is it the algal mats that cause the die off? We don't have an answer for that, but we need to, um, you know, if the um, alternate flora starts coming back through the, the sueda um, or if um, the patents comes back. So again, we need this long-term monitoring. So we need to do it on a regular basis, but for long-term to really understand what's happening. Next. So strategy three is something, uh, I think this one was recommended in the, the Gloucester's CARP report, and that's really understanding how all the system connects and interacts. And so this is um, the pond um, on the other side of Witham Street. We're in the, um, the Good Harbor Marsh that's on the north side of, um, of Thatcher Road, and uh, we're looking over at the pond. So we had begun to study this and it seems like the culvert might be too small, restricting flow. Uh, is there is there um, alewife or other fish that might be using this pond? And we never, it, that was in 2014 and we never followed that up. Next. Um, but this would be a great place to start. We know that Witham Street floods, uh, it's, um, we can measure the, the the culvert height and size and look at the, again, revisit, look at the ecological condition and see if there's a, a, a tidal flow um, possible restoration. But there are homes nearby. It is a pond. So it, again, it's a delicate situation that you have to do correctly. And we're going to get into some case studies um, in a few minutes. So next. And then the last strategy is human use of land. And this is really, uh, we need to look at it now, but it's also a long term because, um, you know, people don't want to change until they're forced to change. Uh, so, but you can see from this Bing map, um, sort of the, um, a little bit of the topo, but also um, the, this one actually, and every pic map you look at um, shows the, the rivers, uh, the streams differently. So you can see that Sea Lion Motel, how it looks like it goes up. Um, I don't know what that's called. You can put it in chat if you know what the pond up in the upper upper of the upper picture 
part of the picture is by the common crow natural market. And then it flows down and that's really looks like the, the what would that be, the east branch of the Saratoga. Uh, we all know where the, the lower one down by Star Market actually you, um, starts very close to downtown. Uh, next. And it's always great to look at historic maps. And I only I kept myself to just one in this presentation because we have short on time. But again, you look at uh, where the wetlands were, um, where the roads were. And so I just put in Shaw's, um, which was up, it's always been up high. But Stop and Shop, which we've talked about, was built in basically in um, in the marsh. And then um, I just want you to know where the Great Republic Drive is. And we're going to go to the next one. And this is uh, a map of the entire Good Harbor uh, watershed that was created by the city of Gloucester probably um, a couple of years ago for sure, it's a draft copy. But you can see that there's many, there's six sub watersheds from the Bass Rocks to the Stop and Shop area, um, East Main Street, way up at Great uh, Republic Drive. Part of that is draining into the Good Harbor system. Um, and then over um, to the right and to with them. So when we talk about protecting the Good Harbor ecosystem, we really need to look at what is happening in this whole, all this land, um, because as we get extreme precipitation events, we are going to um, uh, really need to be, um, we, we need to address that. So next. Um, I'm gonna have to go real quickly here. So um, it's larger than we see, next. And I just wanted to bring this back because now I'm going to go into a couple four case studies where all this public sector funding sources comes together. Next. So uh, I just want you to look at the map on the right. So I'm going to show you four. Uh, this is the Salem Sound watershed. We do work outside of our watershed. We love working in Gloucester, but I'm going to show you Manchester, Beverly and two in Salem. Next. So I'm going to start in Manchester. So this is the Sawmill Brook at Central Street or High uh, Route 127. And you can see the pond um, and then um, the tide gate on the right. And there's um, rainbow smelt have no, been known to spawn um, upstream. Next. In 2006, there was a major flooding and there's been flooding since then. And we can see from the, the red circle, you can see how um, the culvert, um, the bridge, whatever you want to call it, um, it the water it, from upstream is just flowing through the rock. So um, in eight, 2018, 2019, MassDOT considered a severe or major deficiency in this. I also want you to notice the green box in the photo, and that's the tide gate. The tide gate was put in uh, mainly to keep the pond so that people could go skating. There was um, So in 2011, the sawmill or the Manchester's Coastal Stream team and Salem Sound Coast Watch did a survey of the stream and we recommended, they recommended a removal of the tide gate. The select board was looking at replacing the culvert and uh, uh, we all, we went to their meeting and um, convinced them um, that they should do a climate change analysis of the culvert if, before they replace it. Next. And that was back in 2011. And so 11 years later, uh, five grants later, um, the project has um, is ready to go, and now it's a matter of finding the money to make it happen. So um, the, the town has applied to the FEMA BRIC uh, grant um, for about almost uh, $5 million, but since they applied, um, the, you know, the cost just keeps going up. So looking at about an $8 million project on the state highway. Um, when this is completed, there would be a restoration of the area um, where the pond was. And they've all the studies that were done over those five years uh, or 11 years showed that the, it would actually, removing the tide gate would actually increase flood storage capacity and resilience while improving the habitat. So you can come back and look at this slide later um, to see where, the, where they got the grants and uh, look at it uh, a little longer. But I'm gonna go real quick now. I know there's got a lot to cover today. So now we're skipping to Salem. Um, this again was the 2018 storm. Um, so you can just see the damage next. And this is a nature-based solution. 
uh, to coastal flooding. So the pictures at the top were before of this multi-use path. This is a filled tideland. We saw salt marsh plants trying to grow, but always getting eroded because it was just gravel. And so we worked, uh, so we created this salt marsh that you see below. So next. And that was done with the city of Salem and coastal zone management. Uh, we uh, had, again, a series of grants, five years, five grants. Uh, first, a municipal shoreline to find the best place for uh, uh, a living shoreline. Um, it took a long time to design and permit it, uh, but we know more now. And so I think we can get those done faster. And then it took uh, June 2019, we had 100, over 100 volunteers helping us plant this marsh. And then we got a second grant in 2020 to do some mo more monitoring and maintenance. But Samsung Coast Watch is working with the city to continue to monitor this and maintain it. And there's a great story map um, with the link there uh, at salemsound.org, livingshoreline.html, which will tell you the whole story and explain it in detail. Next. And then Salem has just created another uh, living shoreline, and that's at their uh, Forest River Park pool. So the picture on the left shows the pool. It was a, a saltwater pool, um, uh, and the water, the ocean just came in, people went swimming. Then later, um, it was turned into a chlorinated pool. And so you can see the middle picture, you have the, the salt, the seawall not a seawall, but the pool wall, right on the other side of that fence is the pool. So it was right in the intertidal area. Um, the pool was destroyed in 2018, had been repaired many times. So it was actually taken away. Um, Jenna Ide, who uh, worked for the city and made this project happen. Uh, you can see her, she's in the orange and in the back is where the pool is now. Um, and I did wanna just at the bottom, Salem has also been updating their wetland protection ordinance to include climate adaptation and mitigation and increase buffer zones. Next. And so this, it was planted um, last spring. And so you can see where that fence is on the left side or the right, that is where the pool used to come. So now um, it's sloped down and um, there are plants, those are all um, the, the um, salt marsh hay plants and we'll be helping them. And now Salem is working on a flood resilience overlay ordinance, which is will be modeled after the Boston one. Next. Uh, and the last case study I wanted to share with you uh, because um, I've heard, uh, haven't seen it, but I've heard that there is a pump station um, at the corner of Witham and Thatcher Road. And the, the picture on the left is uh, a pump station, Water Street pump station that pumps um, a million gallons of sewage a day from Beverly, all of Beverly, Danvers, and some of most of Middleton. And that's the ones, it all comes to here and then goes over to Salem to the SESD, the wastewater treatment plant. So uh, they got a grant to study this. Again, it's a coastal, a coastal zone management, coastal resiliency grant. Um, the um, near term is they put in flood panels so that uh, if we get a storm, it goes, um, it won't go into the building, next. And then there is a dune in front and we found that the dune provides a positive effect, but it's short term. And in the long run, when you get to 2070, it's not going to stop the flooding, but it's definitely something we want to protect and maintain, next. And this is the last one. And then the other thing that they looked at, and this is something that all our communities need to start looking at, is okay, this is a pump station um, that has certain requirements. Where can it be moved if it has to be moved out because of sea level rise and the increased storm? And so this study actually looked at, uh, found, came up with two possibilities of, um, of land where it could be moved. So it, it's out of the floodplain uh, up until 2070. It sort of took the, the, the heat off for them, but at the same time, they know that at some point they're going to have to, and you wait until you, know, you can't buy the land or you can't do anything there or you start preparing. Again, there's a story map and the link is right there, or you can go to the Beverly page um, to learn more. Uh, next. So, you know, each one of those I could probably talk an hour on or more. Uh, so I'd love to come back or have a, a meet with people to discuss. And in the panel discussion, we can um, 
we certainly uh, feel free to ask any questions. But I know we have a lot to cover tonight. So uh, thank you for listening. And I look forward to being part of the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara. And also thanks to Denton. Our next presentation is with Jane Knott. Jane is the founder of JFK Environmental Services, uh, doing business as Hydro Predictions. It's an environmental consulting firm specializing in groundwater, hydrology, groundwater remediation, and climate change adaptation. Jane has authored several scientific journal articles on climate change adaptation for coastal road infrastructure and on the impacts of climate change on water resources. She was a review editor for the fourth National Climate Assessment and is on Town Green's Board of Directors, as well as the Charles River Watersheds Board of Advisors. Um, Dr. Knott holds a PhD in civil and environmental engineering from the University of New Hampshire and a master's degree in civil and environmental engineering from MIT. Thanks for being with us, Jane. We're looking forward to your presentation. Uh, thank you, Maureen, for that nice introduction. Also, thank you, Denton and Barbara, for that great presentation. That was very uh, inspiring and you know, talking about our beautiful salt marshes uh, is, is something that we we all love to hear about and that we want to uh, continue to uh, keep it healthy and enhance it. Um, it's wonderful to see everyone here this evening. I think we have 76 people. Um, my presentation um, tonight will be a lot different from Denton's and, and Barber's. I'm gonna talk about um, coastal road infrastructure. And so what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to put on your engineer's hat, uh, all of you, and I want you to think about how roads are built. Um, and I'll, I'll walk you through that, but I promise I'll try not to be too technical. So sea levels are likely to rise nearly a foot by the year 2030, two feet by mid-century, and three feet by 2075 in Boston. Most vulnerability studies have focused on tidal surface water flooding from sea level rise, but coastal groundwater will also rise with sea level rise. Um, and coastal groundwater, any kind of groundwater is usually out of sight, out of mind. So uh, we'll be thinking a little bit about that tonight. Um, pavement design historically has assumed that climate related parameters such as groundwater levels and temperature are unchanging over the long term. But this is no longer true. And engineers, um, people in the Department of Public Works, the Department of Transportation, municipal leaders uh, struggle with this. And they ask engineers, what climate parameters do we use for design? Because, you know, in the past and up to present, basically they've used the parameters that have occurred in history. You know, the, the average temperature, the average groundwater level, temperatures go up and down, but generally they're within a certain range. So um, there's uncertainty in the projections and uh, it's difficult for, for the decision makers really to, do, to know what to use. So this is an example. This is uh, a plot of how temperatures are, are rising. And you can see there's a black line Basically, that's about the same, it moves here from the 1900s to 2000, and then it splits off. And you have the higher line, and you have the me medium line, and you have the lower line. So these are projections, and there's uncertainty in these projections. And so the questions are, how will temperature rise affect pavement life in the Northeast? Again, I'm going to be talking about pavements um, as an example, but we can use some of this information in thinking about other assets in communities, including the beach. But for this presentation, I want you to think specifically about roadways and pavements. Um, so the next question would be, which scenario do we use and does it matter? Sea level is also projected to rise. Again, you see the same thing. You see sea level rising gradually through 2000 and then it takes off. It accelerates uh, the, the red curve, then the, the orange curve, the green curve, the light blue curve and the two darker curves are very different. Uh, and that really depends partly on what we humans do in terms of our carbon emissions and also what's happening in Antarctica. 
So how do we deal, how do engineers deal with this uncertainty? Well, first of all, we'll just take a step back and we'll take a look at what sea level rise will look like at Good Harbor Beach and the surrounding area. In the last presentation, um, I showed you these, these, um, these images. Um, and this time, basically, I wanna point out that some of these effects are occurring now with king tides, which are exceptionally high spring tides uh, that occur four times per year. And they also, the, this type of flooding can occur with storm surge, um, as we've seen in some of the storms that have been presented and some that I will present as well. So this is uh, high water plus one foot of sea level rise, or it's what you see with a king tide or one foot of storm surge. This one is with two feet of sea level rise, uh, likely to occur in 2055, or, or it occurs now with two feet of storm surge. This next one is three feet of sea level rise, likely in 2075, or now with three feet of storm surge. And over here, this, is, this area really floods in this condition and conditions before, but um, this is kind of a preliminary analysis and doesn't take into account the culvert here. The next one is four feet of sea level rise, likely in 2090, now with four feet, or occurs now with four feet of storm surge. And then you see flooding over here in this next one, which is five feet of sea level rise. And the reason you see the flooding here is because at this point, it actually flows right over the road. You see Thatcher Road is inundated. Witham Street is inundated. Uh, the, the parking lot has been inundated for the last few that I showed you. So um, now we'll, we'll take a look at some images um, from King Tides that have been taken in the last few years. Uh, these are photographs from Kim Smith. The one on the left is the Good Harbor Beach parking lot flooding. Uh, I believe this is in 2016, flooding with a king tide. Uh, this is Good Harbor Beach and the creek flooding completely. Uh, the water is right up to the bank of the, of the road. Thatcher Road is here. We see flooding of the salt marsh um, and we see it on both sides. We see Nugent, old Nugent Farm over here. So this, this is all flooded. And this is just a king tide. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a glimpse into the future with sea level rise. As you know, it's not only the Good Harbor Beach ecosystem that's affected by climate change and sea level rise. These are photos from Long Beach. Um, you can see the Long Beach Creek, which is flooded, Long Beach itself with uh, seaweed all the way up to the, um, the seawall. Um, and then in the back, the flooding behind the houses. Um, Long Beach and uh, Good Harbor Beach are both similar and different. Um, they're both barrier beaches with wetlands behind the dunes like Barbara was talking about. Good Harbor Beach has been left semi-natural with natural dunes and a beautiful wetland, but encroachments by the parking lot, um, the beach house and filled wetland areas have, have harmed that to, to some extent. Long Beach, on the other hand, has homes built on top of the dunes. Uh, it has a seawall in front of where the dune is and filled wetlands in the back. Um, the town of Rockport is currently debating important issues regarding the renewal of the leases, the land lease there. And this is a, this is a really, really important question that's happening right in our backyard and everyone should be involved in this decision. So sunny day flooding is flooding that occurs without a storm. Um, I, I showed this, this picture in the last uh, workshop and essentially, uh, these incidences of flooding will become more frequent. Today, uh, there are at least 20 days of sunny day flooding in Boston. This is predicted to increase to 75 days a year under the low sea level rise scenario and 150 days under the intermediate sea level rise scenario. And of course, this applies to Gloucester as well. 
So a few photos of storm storms and storm surge. Uh, this is the road to Sudby Motors. And you can see that it's it's inundated, essentially. So now, remember I told you I wanted you to think about pavement engineer and think like a pavement engineer. Um, the thing that pavements hate most of all is water. So asphalt is put on the top of roads to keep water out. When you see cracks in pavements, uh, usually you see the DPW come out and fill those cracks because as soon as water gets in, it starts to cause the pavement to deteriorate and it weakens the underlying layers. This is just another storm, uh, another photo of, of this, this grand storm that we had in 2018 um, with water flowing in behind some homes. Again, we're seeing flooding, flooded roads. And remember, pavements and roads hate water. So um, essentially when I say they hate water, it's because water will cause pavements and actual roadways to deteriorate quicker than um, they were designed for. So why do we care about this? Repeated repair of, uh, of pavements is expensive. Potholes and damaged pavement is dangerous and harmful for motorists and motor vehicles alike. Um, anytime that you have a flooded roadway, it's a disrupted disruption of traffic. Uh, and it could be a loss of an evacuation route. So what can we do about this? Um, sea level rise induced groundwater rise and temperature increases will have significant impacts on the service life of our coastal road infrastructure. But adaptation planning can decrease the costs of these impacts. Um, adaptation planning and adaptation actions today and moving forward into the future. Engineers like to plan and engineers like to engineer solutions. Uh, we've heard about nature-based solutions and they should always be the first step because working with nature is, is more effective and less expensive than working against nature. And at Good Harbor Beach, we have this wonderful salt marsh, which acts as a sponge and it soaks up the, uh, the water. And we should try to expand that wetland if we can. And that specifically will help protect Thatcher Road. Whoops. Uh, but is it still okay to, to drive on flooded and or damaged roads and pavements? Well, this is what happens. So as sea level rises, groundwater also rises. And when we have roads like Thatcher Road that we saw and the road to Sudby Motors, there's wetlands on both sides. And so you can imagine that as the surface water rises, the groundwater also rises. And so it rises into the underlying layers of Thatcher Road's pavement system. And we also have increasing temperatures and the increasing temperatures weaken the asphalt on the top. This black is the asphalt. This, these are the base layers, which are usually made of gravel and a sub base might be sand. And then this is the natural soils. So what happens when the water moves up and the surface is softened by increasing temperatures, you get fatigue cracking and you get rutting. And you can see that this is a mechanism for even more water to get into the road system. But again, is it okay? Is it still okay to drive on a flooded or damaged road and pavements? Maybe, maybe not. This is a situation where it wasn't a good idea. So um, basically, you know, when, when, you, when you have a storm and you see a flooded road and it's blocked by cones and you can't pass through, that's really important. It's really important not to drive in floods because you might get washed away, but it's also important because the pavement may have, the, the underlying layers beneath the pavement may have washed away. They're definitely weaker 
Um, and so DOTs are looking into the issue of when we get flooded roadways, when is it safe to let heavy um, motor vehicles and equipment pass over the road? Um, it's, it's really not safe until uh, the, the flooding has receded and also the groundwater beneath the road has receded after the flooding event. So now I'll talk a little bit about changes in uh, temperature. So as temperature rises, it also changes the length of our seasons. And I think uh, we've all noticed a little bit of that this year. Um, but basically what we're seeing is um, as temperatures rise with climate change, the winter season, which is really good for pavements because it's frozen, um, is projected to be replaced by a lengthening fall season by mid-century. Seasonal pavement damage, which is typically dominated by spring and summer damage, will be distributed more evenly throughout the year. So you'll get damage to your pavements, which used to be frozen solid in the wintertime. I don't know if you've all noticed, but there seems to be more potholes in Boston, Gloucester, all over in New England, essentially. Um, and this is because there's been an increase in the freeze thaw cycles. Our winters are not as cold as they used to be. You get really cold days and then you get this warm thaw. And then you get a really cold day and then you get this warm thaw. It's a freeze thaw cycle, which damages pavements and causes potholes. And so it's not just, you know, the Gloucester or the Boston DPW not doing their job. It's climate change. Uh, now we'll focus a little bit on the groundwater rise. So I'm looking at two things. I'm looking at changing temperatures and changing groundwater caused by sea level rise. So this is a case study in New Hampshire. Actually, these were two case studies, but I'm gonna focus only on one, which is this regional corridor route 286 in Seabrook, New Hampshire. The reason I'm showing you both of these is because the pavement structure is different um, for these two roads. Uh, Gosling Road is different from Route 286. This is a cross section of the pavement structure. So this is Route 286. It has an asphalt layer here and a thin base layer, 16 inches, a gravel base layer, and then the natural soils beneath it. So it's a pretty thin pavement structure. Gosling Road has a uh, a thin asphalt layer, but a pretty thick, uh, you know, underlying layers. It has crushed gravel, gravel, sand, and then the natural soils beneath it. These these plots are showing um, the uh, what happens with sea level with rising groundwater caused by sea level rise. The performance of this pavement, Route 286, drops way off as groundwater rises in the pavement structure. This has a, a more robust pavement structure and you can see that it's more resilient to rising, uh, to the effects of rising groundwater in the underlying structure. So essentially the structure of the pavement matters. Uh, in our study, we in New Hampshire, we found that 23% of New Hampshire's coastal roads are at risk for premature failure, failure pavement failure with six feet of sea level rise if adaptation actions are not taken. <clears throat> Structural modifications to the base of the road, uh, the, the base layers can eliminate the, pro uh, the projected 80 to 90% service life reduction, but will and will delay the pavement inundation by 20 years. So essentially you're raising the road and you're also making it stronger. But increasing the thickness of the base is, is extremely expensive. So it's not something that every community wants to take on. So adaptation strategies, and I'll be, I'll be quick here, hopefully. Um, there are two approaches. Usually communities will take the top, will initially take the top down approach to adaptation. And what that means is um, they'll choose one, two, or three climate change scenarios and then de design their asset. In this case, we're talking about roads to meet the requirements of one of them. 
Uh, usually the most robust solution is the best solution, right? But it's always the most expensive. And sometimes uh, communities won't do anything because it's too expensive. The most robust solution is not always the best solution. It may not be needed. Um, and as we talked about in the beginning, there's a lot of uncertainties in the climate projections. And so you really don't want to spend a lot of money up front too soon doing too much if it's not necessary. First of all, there's, there's not enough money for that. Anyway, the, the next way that you can look at it is called the bottom-up approach, and that's where you learn about your asset. You know that, let's say, temperature is going to rise, and you know that groundwater is going to rise and maybe affect your coastal roads. So take a look at incremental um, changes in those parameters and see um, where the tipping point is in the performance of your asset. And using both of these is called the hybrid approach. And, and I'm gonna talk a little more about the hybrid approach. This is, um, this is really a flow chart to follow when incorporating climate change into pavement repair and, and maintenance. I'm not gonna go through it all, but you can take a look at it later if you, if you go back to the recording. Um, this is called the Pavement Climate Sensitivity Catalog, and, and this is taking the steps that I was just talking about, where you really learn about your asset. Um, this box here is looking at a gravel base of 16 inches. This is a gravel base of 20 inches. This is a gravel base of 24 and 28. Um, and basically, we're looking at temperature rise over here and groundwater rise over here, and essentially what what the engineer is doing is looking at these various adaptation options and seeing what works. So this shows the, uh, the thickness of hot mix asphalt needed to achieve 85% pavement reliability for temperature rise and incremental groundwater rise. And the green is good and the red is bad. Um, this, this option here, the 20 inch gravel base is not good. This is what we're starting with. These two options are better. So essentially it's a way for engineers to look at the changes in the climate parameters and see how it affects the asset. Then what you do is you look at a number of different adaptation pathways, which are a series of adaptation actions. And in our study, we looked at 13 adaptation pathways. And, um, Essentially, what we did was eliminate a lot of them and cut it back to, to five based on cost, based on effectiveness. Um, so the, these kinds of exercises are, are used to answer these questions. Do you raise the road? How do you raise the road? Is it by thickening the base? Is it by building a bridge? Um, number two, how much, if you're going to thicken the base, how thick are you going to make it? When do you do the reconstruction? Do you do it now? Do you wait until 2040? Do you wait until 2060? Do you wait until 2090? You know, when do you make these changes? What is the most efficient? What is the most cost effective? What is the cost of all of these options? So um, this is called an adaptation pathway map and it looks a lot like a subway uh, map, essentially. And you start on the left here and you move along. Uh, this is adaptation pathway one. And adaptation pathway one is just putting overlays on the road, but doing it with a, with a specific thickness based on calculations and a specific time frame. So you're not rebuilding the base, but you're doing a pavement, an asphalt overlay here, 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 here here and here. So essentially every 10 years you're doing an overlay. And the next figure that I'm gonna show you tells how thick that overlay should be based on calculations. Now, what we found, um, if you go along this pathway and then you jump up here to pathway three, that's basically reconstructing the road um, to a 24 inch base from a 16 inch base. Um, and that happens now. In 2040, 
that would be called pathway seven. So you do the same thing, but you wait until 2040. Uh, in 2060, you do the same thing, but you, you wait till 2060 and that's called pathway 11. On pathway 12, you, you make a 28 inch base. Um, and then over here, you raise the road by building a bridge. This is where it's estimated that the road would be flooded. So essentially, this is a step way, stepwise adaptation plan where you move along the curve. And if, if you have to rebuild the road because of damage or, you know, a fire truck fell into a hole or, or, or whatever, then you, you have a plan not to rebuild it the way it was built before, but to rebuild it with a thicker base. The costs, when we look at this, the pathway one of just overlays, asphalt overlays, is the cheapest. Pathway 11, which is this one, um, no, this one, is you rebuild the roadway um, in 2060. So basically what we did was we narrowed the number of options from 13 to five based on cost and performance and we created an adaptation pathway map with the cost. The conclusions from this analysis is for the road in Seabrook, which is very much like Thatcher Road, it's best to delay reconstruction or raising the road until it's necessary from damage or failure or inundation. However, if you do that, you have to have um, asphalt overlays that are at prescribed th thicknesses and in prescribed times based on calculations, which is required to need to maintain the integrity of the, of the pavement with the rising groundwater and the rising temperatures. That's all built into this analysis. Uh, and this is just a plot that shows essentially the, the thicknesses um, of the asphalt overlays. And this is an example of how you'd work through it. You be begin. Um, you begin with um, pathway one, which is a 16-inch base, and then in 2020 you apply a 32 millimeter asphalt thickness, followed by 22, 20 millimeters in 2030, and 13 millimeters in 2040, and so on and so forth. And then you reevaluate based on where you are with the climate scenarios and with the um, amount of traffic and all of that. So I'm almost finished. Um, the case study conclusions, uh, a stepwise and flexible adaptation framework was demonstrated at a case study in coastal New Hampshire. Uh, the hot mixed asphalt overlays of prescribed thickness and implementation schedule was the least costly option. Pavement management without considering climate change is the most costly option. So essentially when the road gets flooded and gets damaged and they rebuild the road exactly the same way, that is the most costly option. It, it seems like it's the cheapest at the time, but it's not because you'll, you'll be doing that again and again and again. At the case study site, climate change scenarios um, affected the adaptation costs, but the adaptation pathway choice was dictated by rehabilitation efficiencies and implementation timing. So Cape Ann coastal roads, basically what we should do here in Cape Ann is to create a vulnerability map of the coastal roadways um, for flooding, sea level rise, uh, induced groundwater rise and temperature changes. Um, determine the pavement life service reduction which we can do with calculations and evaluate adaptation strategies. Now have these strategies in place so that we can do a stepwise um, mitigation uh, and then and develop a flexible adaptation plan that can be changed as you go along. Um, so basically uh, it's tempting to say when, when you see those maps of flooding Thatcher Road, it's tempting to say, oh, we have to we have to raise the road or we have to abandon the road or what are we gonna do? But if with a little bit of planning and a little bit of engineering um, and understanding your asset, you can work with these climate 
changes that are happening. They're happening slow enough so that we can keep pace. Um, and then eventually we'll have to do that, but uh, we'll have to do that on a more cost-effective basis. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jane, for that informative um, presentation. And we do have a couple of questions for Jane that we will get to uh, during the panel and the Q&A. Um, next up are our Charles Waldheim and Kira Klinging from the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Charles Waldheim is the John E. Irving Professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Design and the Director of the Office for Urbanization. Waldheim's research examines the relationship between, between landscape ecology and contemporary urbanism. Kara Klinger is a lecturer in landscape architecture at the Harvard Graduate School of Design and a research associate for the Office of Urbanization. Welcome, Kira and Charles. Thanks so much, Maureen. It's a pleasure to be back. I uh, hope everyone's staying dry out there this evening. I want to begin just by saying um, a little bit about who we are, but first acknowledging the extraordinary work done by our colleagues here. I think uh, Denton and, and Barbara and Jane's presentation were really extraordinary examples of the breadth of knowledge that's available here. Um, uh, you know, the Good Harbor Beach is this extraordinarily both kind of resilient, but also very fragile natural system. Um, the beachfront, the foreshore, its dunes, its salt marsh behind these things are all connected. And historically, these um, things have been able to move and migrate in the way that natural systems adapt to changing environments, um, climate among them, sea level rise among them. Uh, the combination of sea level rise and the impingement upon that dune ecosystem is such now that um, we've prevented the marsh and the dune system from really adapting itself. And therefore we have to really think of them in relationship to the hard infrastructures um, that Jane was describing, not only roads, but also bridges, water systems, et cetera. Um, one of the implications of you know, adaptation to climate change is that it will affect virtually all of the built infrastructure and all of the natural systems, all of the biomes of Cape Ann and it will do so incrementally over time. And so the kind of very detailed analysis that Jane was showing us with respect to roadway, imagine applying that to every system across the public realm of Cape Ann. It's really an extraordinary challenge, but also a great opportunity to think about, um, about the future. Um, so we come from the Graduate School of Design. So we are architects, landscape architects, and planners, urban designers, ecologists, engineers. Um, our research group, the Office for Urbanization, we work with communities to help to visualize, to think about change in the built environment over time. Um, and what we wanna stress here is, you know, we've been working for the past several years with the Cape Climate Coalition and our good friends at Town Green and have really benefited enormously from that collaboration. And we're very pleased to be here again uh, this evening to share with you some of the work that we have in progress. Um, the other thing that I wanna stress is that our work is very much in progress. Uh, we don't yet have any recommendations. We're working to develop those over the course of the next several years. Um, but what I wanna reinforce here is the notion that it's not our role coming from the outside to uh, decide the future of Cape Ann. You know, Cape Ann's future will be developed by, by Cape Ann. And ultimately uh, each of you in civil society, individuals, institutions, uh, elected and appointed officials, the business sector, uh, every actor uh, in, in play will have their own set of choices to, to confront. Uh, our role really is to help to think about those changes, to help look at precedents and best practices from here, but also further afield, and to help illuminate, shed light on choices going forward. And the work that we'll share with you uh, this evening is very much in that spirit next. Um, as you may know, uh, in the previous workshop, um, we presented, um, we presented a, a, the beginnings of a scenario zero. In, if we can advance this, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, so we've been working on a series of scenarios. We work in a form of scenario-based planning. What that means is we're looking at um, near and medium term potential outcomes. Our goal is not to predict the future, but rather to use that scenario planning to shed light on decision-making in the present term and to identify um, kind of secondary and tertiary outcomes. You know, the built environment is very complex and things are all related. Uh, last time we got together, we shared with you the work we had developed around this future storm event of 2038 using a fictional future uh, middling sized train to address questions of 
kind of stress test just to see how the systems on Cape Ann might respond. And tonight we're gonna to share with you just briefly the introduction to our thinking about the possibility of adaptations going forward. Next. Uh, in this work, what we've done is really by, by methodological terms, a form of mixed methods scenario planning. We've identified a range of precedents. We've also surveyed the literature and identified a range of adaptation measures that have either been proposed or considered on Cape Ann. So what we're sharing with you tonight are not our ideas, but rather a kind of synthetic uh, consolidation of a variety of ideas that have been placed. I wanna start with two simple ideas next, which are straightforward enough, but I think underscore our work and we would share with you in this conversation. The first is that no single strategy is going to eliminate the impacts of coastal flooding and the effects of climate change and increased storm events across Cape Ann. We really need a range, a menu of different approaches and strategies. Next. And secondly, our focus here and our recommendations will be focused on uh, addressing uh, the public realm, both the natural systems approach, uh, the Denton and Barber reinforced, but also the notion of the infrastructure in the public realm. It's not that private land holdings or private institutions or private companies are not important here. They also have to play a part, but we're beginning very much with a natural systems approach reinforced with hard infrastructure, a gray and green combination in which we're addressing the future of the public realm. Uh, we believe that it will be quite possible to protect Cape Ann, to make Cape Ann resilient over time. And as you do that, it's very possible that you will really do damage to both the natural systems that have occurred there over time, but also the amenity, the economy, the kinds of things that draw people to Cape Ann. And so our goal is to think about the natural world from a kind of holistic point of view, but integrating it with processes of urbanization and infrastructure. Next. And what I'll turn to now is really the first of two parts to our portion of the presentation. The first part are a series of strategies that we've seen from elsewhere, precedent projects that we've seen elsewhere that might provide a kind of way of thinking about the menu of options available on Cape Ann. And we've organized those into five broad strategies. I'll invite my colleague, uh, Professor Kira Klingen, to share those with you here. Thanks, Charles, and thank you, everyone. It's really exciting to be here again. Um, and so these five strategies are simply ways to kind of think through adaptation measures. Um, and it's important to think of these as more of a conceptual framework, beginning with what we're doing right now. So thinking through communication strategies, ways to share and convey information, and then moving on into resistance strategies to remain in place, ways to accommodate flooding while remaining in place. And then finally thinking about in the event of recurring flooding or recurring losses, ways to avoid and simply move out of the way of flooding or water. And finally, all of this really revolves around capacity building strategies. So making sure that we have the political will and the community buy-in um, to develop leadership and resources, which as Charles said, is not our domain. That's something that um, we all will take on as a community. Next. And so I'll begin uh, just kind of reinforcing what we were doing tonight, um, which Town Green has put together and just creating places to communicate and build plans for future action. Next. Um, and this, uh, as we've talked about during these two presentations, there are multiple different stakeholders across Cape Ann and even at Good Harbor Beach. And all of these different actors come together very often in what's called a coastal management plan. And so a coastal management plan is put together often by the Office, Office for Coastal Zone Management, and it's produced across a broad range of civil society. And it really establishes a broad vision for how adaptation will take place holistically and which group will take ownership for what. So just as Jane was talking through those adaptation pathways, making sure that each group and each agency and stakeholder understands what their responsibility is. Next. And these plans can include a work plan to establish early warning systems, which is really a way to make sure that folks know when extreme weather is coming, like the storm that we shared during our last um, presentation. And so these can include evacuation route markings along major highways, uh, similar to what you see when you're driving along Cape Cod. Um, and then also sensors about hydrological information, including how fast water is rising in the Good Harbor Marsh, and also what areas are most at risk of flooding. Next. And there are also really incredible precedents from around the globe. Barbara shared a few local precedents that were fascinating to remain in place. Next. And one of these is beach nourishment. 
Uh, this simply involves replacing sediment that is eroded or drifted away, and it's a temporary solution just because it's a repetitive process similar to uh, re-adding asphalt again to roads that can really become costly over time, and this strategy has already been deployed across the North Shore. Next. And as Barbara talked about, constructing dunes is another way to build on the existing dune system at Good Harbor Beach. Um, after storms in the past, these dunes have been reconstructed with additional sediment, which also obviously requires a longer term management plan to make sure that all the grasses and vegetation that are planted in the dunes um, are kind of nurtured and can hold the sand in place to reduce erosion in the long term. Next. Another option out in the water and also in some nearshore marsh areas are precedents like this living breakwater that's in Connecticut. Living breakwaters um, are a combination of green and gray infrastructure. They're breakwaters that reduce wave energy and they also incorporate natural habitat. So you can have oysters, mussels, or hard, hard coral integrated into these systems and they can be deployed along the coast to reduce wave energy. They break the wave energy as it's coming on shore, which helps to then reduce erosion on the beach. Next. In some cases, it may be preferable to remain in place and simply allow flooding at some times. Next. And so just like adding sand through beach renourishment and then also restoring dunes, wetland enhancement is another option, um, especially a good harbor where you have agricultural ditches that allow flooding in much more quickly than in other areas. This can include adding sediment to the marsh as a nature-based solution to elevate the existing marsh. Next. And another option, as Charles was talking about these different infrastructural systems, is to start thinking about drainage maintenance. Um, so thinking about ways to add bioswales, ditches, and other storm drains that help to make sure that roads are safe during flood events. Um, and this is really a solution with a lot of different co-benefits. Planting along roadsides help to filter stormwater. It also slows the flow of water, and it increases the amount of permeable surfaces that allows water to drain. Next. Uh, but in some cases, especially with critical infrastructure elements, we simply need to move out of the way. Next. And so kind of across the country, there have been examples where there are just critical evacuation routes or other assets like sewer pump stations that are realigned. And so asset realignment is a fairly common procedure. Um, and essentially what it does is it just moves assets like roadways and infrastructure away from their existing locations inland into areas that are less likely to erode and less likely to flood. And what I really want to highlight here is that this is not only a process of realignment of moving roads or other infrastructures back, but then also of ecological restoration. So making sure to replant and return those areas to nature in perpetuity. Next. And another really kind of key adaptation option that Gloucester is already kind of a pioneer with uh, is overlay districts like the Atlantic Road Overlay District. And these are zoning regulation tools that simply ensure that new construction does not take place in highly vulnerable areas. Next. And overlay, um, overlay districts and other kind of zoning regulations are a really nice way to start a conversation around rolling easements. Um, rolling easements are a way to relocate vulnerable infrastructure. And so these are conservation easements that roll upland as sea level rise and coastal erosion cause coastline encroachment. This is something that the state of Maine to our north has all along their shoreline. And they don't restrict land use on parcels, but they do restrict building additional seawalls or other coastal infrastructure. So essentially rolling easements just ensure that people aren't building seawalls or other things that will scour the coast in areas that are at risk. Next. And of course, all of these actions require leadership and resources that can only be developed through really meaningful capacity building. Next. And this just starts with community buy-in, a buy-in, sorry. So requiring engaged in citizens like yourselves to build political will and support a vision for adaptation. Next. And I wanna end on one additional precedent, um, thinking about kind of land trusts and also rolling easements and other techniques to transfer the ownership of properties um, that are likely to flood um, into the public realm. And so one kind of cutting edge example that we have uh, is provided by John Englander, and this is called a shoreline adaptation land trust or a SALT. This is a unique solution where a land trust is established uh, pro bono, so for no fee, 
and private and commercial real estate owners can donate coastal real estate that is vulnerable to flooding, but instead of leaving their property immediately, they're allowed the full use of their property for their lifetime. And often this is incentivized in some way, either by nonprofit organizations or municipal governments uh, by ending property taxes or giving a tax deductible gift for the donation of the property. And so again, this is kind of a unique um, adaptation measure that is starting to be talked about. Next. And we'll really briefly share a few of the strategies that could be deployed at Good Harbor Beach. Next. And I really want to emphasize what Charles said, that these are very much, much further out solutions that are just tests. Um, and our key recommendation is just reinforcing the dune systems and the agricultural dishes um, and making sure that those nature based solutions are implemented to reconstruct the system. Another thing to think about in the future is simply Thatcher Road repetitively flooding and whether Thatcher Road might be a candidate for either being realigned um, or elevated. Also thinking about living breakwaters that may be constructed to reduce wave energy um, and how individual homeowners might consider building level adaptation like adding freeboard or elevating their homes out of reach of floodwaters. Next. And this is an image of our 2070 sea level rise pro uh, projections. And so again, this is on a much longer time scale. We're thinking up until 2070, which is two mortgages away. And in the meantime, there are many incremental adaptation measures that can strengthen the beach ecosystem. Next. And so again, these are things like living breakwaters that provide additional habitat, constructed dune systems that already build on the ecosystem that exists, and then enhancing wetlands and filling in agricultural ditches. Next. Um, and we have these kind of just very basic schematic renderings showing additional um, planting uh, that might take place in the future. Next. And also thinking about ways to add habitat into uh, the good harbor marsh behind the beach. Next. And just to end, it's really important to think about how these actions at Good Harbor are part of a larger plan for Gloucester around coastal zoning, uh, thinking back to the coastal management plan, and also thinking about ways to use experimentation with overlay districts to ensure that other areas are affected as well. And so any change that you make to the Good Harbor ecosystem, whether it's building a seawall or adding nature-based solutions, will have an effect on the larger ecosystem. Next. And I'll post the link uh, in the chat to our ongoing work that again is in progress and you can spend additional time with these different adaptation measures um, for Good Harbor Beach and other areas. Next. Thank you. Thanks, Kira. Thanks, Kira. Thanks, Charles. I really appreciate that um, presentation. We are all going to invite the the speakers to come in right now, including Dick Prouty from Town Green. And we're gonna take questions uh, from our participants. So please feel free to add some uh, questions into the chat and I will get to those um, as, as we move forward. Just as a reminder that the video, the recording of this presentation will be available on the Town Green website, along with access to the slides in case you wanna take a deeper look uh, at any of our presenters um, presentations. So thanks for being with us uh, presenters. We really appreciate you being here. Um, I'm gonna throw uh, a question um, to Jane uh, first actually. And uh, Jane, um, I'm, we're curious, you know, you talked about Thatcher Road a little bit, but what are some other roads in greater Cape Ann that might experience um, premature failure due to sea level rise and induced groundwater rise and flooding? Uh, well, all of all of Thatcher Road, as you go into um, as you go into Rockport, you know, behind Long Beach would be one. Um, the rotary uh, on Route 128, the first rotary that you come to when you come into Gloucester, that's a, that's a low land. Um, the the groundwater is pretty high there. Um, I think there's also a section of, of roadway, highway, um, before you come over the bridge. Um, there's a very low area actually by um, Sudby. Um, those are some examples. Basically, in general, 
the roads that would be in, in impacted by rising groundwater due to sea level rise would be um, coastal roads right along the coast that are low. So um, if if your your road is by the coast but it's quite high, the groundwater uh, is is going to be closer to sea level and it won't be an issue. Um, these these roads typically have flooding problems already. So um, the roads that have flooding problems are the ones that are gonna to continue to have flooding problems and the flooding problems will be worse. That's mm -hmm. true. And Maureen, if I, if I could add, I, I think, you know, Barbara showed that uh, she, she limited herself to one historical map and a remarkable show of restraint for somebody who's historically minded. We use, you know, the historic wetlands and marsh, uh, you know, locations as a surrogate for that, both for elevation, but also, you know, proclivity to flood again. And so I think the combination of proximity to shore and the historic marshes that have been filled in are a good surrogate for that. And as an example of that, I think it might surprise some people that Maplewood Avenue is all filled in filled marsh. So that is a, not that close to the water, but it used to be marsh. And also I think Bass Avenue is an extension of Thaster Road in a way going right up through into downtown is part of the natural drainage system from the marsh into the inner harbor that has been blocked. Uh, a friend of mine was part of the city blocking it in the 60s to facilitate uh, development. Yes, and also Essex Causeway. Mm -hmm. Right. right, the causeway. And also um, Eric Hutchins uh, says that Penzance Road in Rockport, um, also Pebble Beach, uh, it's most likely the first road on Cape Ann that will be lost due to sea level rise. Um, just as a note for that. Um, I want to throw a, a message out to Barbara. I mean, a, a question out to Barbara. Um, which which coastal adaptation ca cases that you uh, reviewed on the in Salem and in the North Shore, what seems most applicable to Good Harbor, the adaptation? Um, and so what are those options and how might that happen? Um, well, I, I didn't share those to say this is what should be done at Good Harbor. It was more that, that this is the process. Um, I, you know, you already have like this, the living shoreline, the marsh had been destroyed. And we brought back the marsh in those particular living shorelines. Um, the, the pump station, definitely Gloucester should be looking at the pump station because that isn't an area that's going to flood. So um, that's not about the ecosystem itself, but you want a, um, the pump station to work. Otherwise, you do will damage your ecosystem and, and your homes. Um, so that, that would be one. Uh, but it's more. Uh, and then what was the other one I shared? Oh, the, and then the Manchester one. Again, looking at roads um, that go that interact between the ocean and um, a resource, like if there was a pond, um, they'll be restoring it to a salt marsh. Um, in the Good Harbor system, except for up by the stop and shop, there's a lot that could be done there, but I don't know if people are really ready to do that, right? <laughs> um, well, so it's all you, about timing. What, and, you, what, do you mean, what do you mean by that? Could you just tell us <laughs> uh, well, what do you think? Uh, Oh, it, at the stop and shop? Yeah. Well, I think it's what people are saying. You know, what are the first roads to flood? The ones that were filled in, right? That have gone over, that filled in wetlands or marshes. Um, so the same would be for a uh, building um, that was in filled, is on filled tideland or filled salt marsh. Those would be, be the first threatened ones. So either you as a community come together and say, we can't have that gone and we have to protect it some way using a hard structure, uh, gray infrastructure, seawalls, or um, you, you figure out a managed retreat. Um, but that's a whole long conversation mm -hmm. um, and a lot of planning. And, and that was the case studies I was trying to show, like in Manchester, it's been 11 years, right? Um, and there is funding out there, but you have to start because nothing happens overnight. Uh, you really, even a, a living shoreline, which you would have thought, oh, we should just be able to go out and do that next year. It, it still took us five years to do it. Mm -hmm. And then you have to, you know, keep it going. Right. So if we're looking at these different timelines um, for 
uh, you know, adaptation planning and then implementation. And I guess this is a question for the group. Um, what, what are some things that, is there any way that we could break down that time or is it just built in because of the way that these adaptation solutions can be implemented? I mean, is there a way that we could do something that is a good, a good adaptation solution um, and that that could be built on? So uh, anybody want to take that? I mean, I, I can start at least. Um, I think what we've seen both in the literature and the precedents that are available and, and uh, the way that we approach these problems is uh, it's such a complex, you know, socio-cultural biological set of phenomenon that um, our approach is really uh, plural. That it, rather than thinking of something, you know, synthetic or unified, that this will involve essentially all of civil society in various ways and on various timelines. And so the way that we think about this is that the climate is already changing, uh, the biomes, you know, the asphalt is already changing, and people, individuals, institutions are already making choices. You see it in reinsurance markets, you see it in property values, you see it in um, climate gentrification. Uh, so in that regard, the idea that things are already changing and people are already making choices and that that decision-making will likely be disaggregated It'll be disaggregated amongst different um, incentives, different individuals and interest groups uh, along different time horizons. Uh, and as that happens, I think one of the role of this kind of a group would be to organize public opinion to focus on the public realm and the shared both natural resources, but also on the hard infrastructure and the life safety infrastructure that we depend upon. Thanks, Charles. Uh, Dan, did you, did you wanna say something about this? Denton, you're muted. Okay, from the point of view of community action, and here we are in Gloucester, Massachusetts, which is a community, and Good Harbor is a community, there's some small steps in the beginning, even though they don't make the largest impact, can be very significant. I think when you got the people involved in a roadway path there, and also with the fencing of the dunes, and now we have some opportunities with further attention to the dunes, which is an attractive the planting of grass there. We have had people do that before, but it's never been on an organized basis. And it certainly has not been sustained on an annual basis. And in addition, our work on the Save Salt Island issue of trying to preserve that as a, a place for people, could children go over and they learn from it, it is really an opportunity for education, understanding the ecology and the importance that that island plays. And so all of these add up to education, <clears throat> education sites around that make that, that lead people to understand it, that build the community out and their support for all of this in an organized way. And finally, I would mention that culvert at Witham Street. Maybe that's not the one, but something like that in which it's clearly selected as a priority. It's in the CARP plan to do it, and that would open up a new area. One of those projects could be selected, and I think it could be a community initiative, but in partnership with the city and all the other partners, because it's in the plan. So I would just add that it is a learning process. So uh, for the community uh, to, uh, and, and the municipalities and nonprofits who are working with them, um, to figure out how, you know, what's going to be the first priority, um, what's doable, um, the adaptation um, pathways that Jane shared are, are, is a very effective way of working through what we should be doing now, what we're going to have to do when, you know, it might not be 2050, but when the sea le level rise gets to a certain point. So, yeah, but you, you need, what I'm encouraging is that and, and you're already doing it, Town Green is promoting it, is beginning this process and be, be beginning it with things that can involve the, like the dune restoration, but then also the more complex ones that are gonna take time. Jane, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'll just jump in quickly and say that um, some communities, many communities now are, are including climate change in their uh, comprehensive plans for, for the town. Um, and because comprehensive plans um, consider transportation and water supply and all of these these issues, uh, tourism and 
and so on. If if you take those various important issues for the town and you make sure that you consider climate change when you're making your plans and and de developing those documents, um, that's a great step. And then that's a guiding tool for the community. Um, great. Uh, I saw that Ed Hand had his hand up. Um, Ed, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Um, uh, Maureen? Yeah. I just want to build on what Jane said because, you know, at the uh, 26th, <clears throat> the, the uh, symposium we did with GMF, uh, the mayor has announced the master planning process that's going to begin in 2023. And I think uh, by building awareness of all these issues through the different programs that this is the first of one in each of the four KPN communities, Town Green is gonna be advocating for building climate into planning at you know, all four communities on KPN. And in Gloucester uh, being the largest one and having a master plan kick off, that would be a natural one for us to, to uh, be a voice in advocating for climate impact uh, assessment and activities in the master plan, because that will be, a, I, I think, at least a 10 to, 10 to 15 or 20 year process we're planning for. So that goes well into some of the scenarios that we've heard from tonight from the different people on the panel. Thanks, Dick. Um, there's a, a question from Jerry Goulart. How would you allow, oh, let me see. How would allowing the Good Harbor ecosystem, um, well, how would the Good Harbor ecosystem be affected by allowing it to run its natural course by returning its back to the inner harbor flow via Hart Street um, and the marsh beyond and also 128 extension from Eastern Ave to Bass Ave? Somebody want to take that? It's a big project. Um, Barbara may want to say something about that. I, th I think it, it's it's just a, you know, we're talking about, it's so it's good awareness to know that it's a vulnerability. So if we had like the large storm, if we have a large storm scenario, then that will accelerate a lot of that happening and we'll be forced to do it. I think until then there won't be much, yeah. it's, it's way too big. But if there's a big, 15 foot storm surge that comes in over two tides in a three day storm. Well, we won't have any choice. Um, thanks, Dick. Any yeah. other further comments? Yeah. yeah, I would just say agree with him. And, um, you know, 2018, when we had um, extreme high tides and five foot storm surge, that was really a wake up call for many communities on the North Shore. Um, and until something uh, similar, uh, uh, you know, your scenario storm of uh, 2038, um, we can imagine, but I think uh, planning that and maybe we have it sort of in the back pocket, what would, it, you know, it might be interesting to, to sit down and vision what it would be like if, if you had to give that up and what you would lose. At, I wouldn't be able to tell you, but it, it's not going to, you know. Uh, it it's, would be traumatic, right? <laughs> um, I so, I, I, you know, I think you need to, but it would be interesting. Jane? Cross. Yeah, so so I would just say I, I um, the comments that have already gone before me are, are excellent. Um, I would say, you know, the first steps would be what, what Denton and Barbara have described and also Charles and Kira about the dunes, uh, about the ditches, about the culverts and things like that. The next step, in my opinion, would be the parking lot. Um, it's already flooding. It's already flooding now. It's uh, it's filled wetland. There's no building there, um, and there's options for you know transporting people to the beach or whatever. But that would provide us with more storage, much more storage, if we restored wetland and you know, make that a healthy wetland system. It's a, it's a great point, Jane. And, and we, we have great data on, you know, the extent to which these wetlands absorb, you know, energy and mitigate it and store water over time. In that regard, in the same way that we're looking at historically filled, you know, wetland areas as vulnerable, 
we can also look at publicly owned land of various typologies. And, you know, obviously every piece of land publicly owned or not is spoken for its ways by various levels of government has plans, you know, baked in. But at the same moment, those would be the places to start to look would be the kind of things in the public realm. In, in, connect, in connection with what Jane just said, um, the expansion of salt marsh could also occur because the driveway into the parking lot has cut off the marsh that is to the east of the parking lot, the whole area there. And uh, Allison uh, made, uh, took us there on the tour so we could see how different the vegetation is. I think Barbara is of different minds on this. That is, we need to study that to see where was the original marsh flow. But I don't know if it's a half acre or an acre, but to open up that area, you can still have the parking lot over, I presume, or to at least consider that area for expansion is sort of an extension of what you were saying, Jane. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, any other thoughts on, on that topic? I just wanted to let everybody know that uh, what everybody is, not everybody, a lot of people are, as a result of the seminars over the past year, have become aware of the need for emergency planning scenarios. And so um, we're working with Greg Fetishbeel and working with the different municipalities and uh, possibly involving Harvard to get uh, some tabletop exercises to start that are not that expensive. And that's one of the ones when cure is a communication so that at least we know what to do when everything gets wiped out. You know, we've got we've got hardwired communication so we can communicate to everybody. That's that's number one. And then one of the evacuation, how do we get to hospitals and all those kinds of questions? I think people are now fairly aware of the need for that, um, where they might not have been a couple of years ago. So I think that's real progress. Yeah, there was a comment um, related to uh, whether or not Rockport and Gloucester are working together to address, you know, Thatcher Road is an evacuation route. Um, and it will be important for the municipalities to work together as a group, as Dick said, um, to take a look at this. And it's also something that I hope that Town Green will address in the coming years um, as, as we take a look at those issues um, and, and do some more research. Uh, another question from the participants um, would creating a flood overflow pond in the public land by para research be helpful. I don't know if you know familiar with that area. It's kind of um, it's an old school that was remade into um, um, offices, and there's there's like I forget the name of it. Denton, you might know. It's like lower pond or upper pond. It was East Gloucester elementary school. Are you talking about Day's Pond, which is just to the north of Eastern Avenue? Um, there's a series of, um, there's that, what I used to call Frog Pond, but that's not the right name for it. Um, nor, uh, it's when you're coming down near near the vet um, and the Dunkin' Donuts, there's a pond on Eastern Ave and then- Yes, uh, that, that's Day's, further pond, down. that's Day's Pond. Kids ice skate okay. on it. Lilies grow in it, and it's it leads into a brook that comes down into Saratoga Creek. Right. So um, I'd like to respond to that because I I did mention it, but you know it's so hard to get so much into um, a, a few minutes. Um, I think it's really important to look at the the total watershed, and it, the 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 salt marsh and the creek and the erosion is influenced by how much water is coming off of the upper part of the watershed. So if if you have ways of maintaining it. Um, rain gardens, uh, storm storage, swales, um, increasing uh, your capacity of ponds that exist by getting rid of, you know, Phragmites or something like that, um, you, you will be helping the marsh. It seems disconnected in most people's minds because it's up there and it's not salt marsh, but it, it's all flowing down and it's affecting the creek. It's affecting um, the pollution of the, of the creek as well. 
So if we can use um, uh, um, low impact development stormwater, green stormwater infrastructure upstream, it will help the marsh. I've seen one reinforce. estimate, Barbara, that's a thousand acres pouring into a hundred acres. I can I can reinforce that. I think it's an excellent point. I mean, in other contexts that are denser or more heavily urbanized, subsurface water storage can be a part of the overall mix. But here, I would agree, surficial strategies would be what we would look at, and in particular, trying to store and slow down water in as many contexts as possible, whether they be swales, uh, storm gardens, and a range of different menus. That so, in in that context, anything we can do to get you know, Im impervious surface out of what was historically wetland and allow the wetland to basically grow in a more healthy way would be uh, a good thing. Um, we have a question about stormwater runoff um, that impacts the water quality, uh, the vegetation and the habitat of the marsh and the ecosystem. Um, there are a lot of industrial uh, uses uh, from the Morse Park that is directly abuts the stream leading to the marsh. Um, yeah. and, and so I don't know, we don't have anybody from the city of Gloucester on uh, the panel right now, but I wonder if any of you could address um, stormwater runoff, um, which is kind of similar, I think, to what you were just discussing. Kira, do you want to take do you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, all of these drainage maintenance strategies are really helpful, especially I want to second what Barbara said about adding bioswales. And that's something that can be done if there are roads that are refinished to Jane's point, adding asphalt. That's something that can be part of that construction process and just widening the amount of area that water has to flow and also adding plants that filter stormwater. So that can be part of a comprehensive drainage management plan. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kira. Anyone else want to touch on stormwater runoff? Um, Ed, I think you can unmute if you want to ask your question. Well, we'll keep trying, Ed. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll keep trying. Um, uh, Jane, there's a question early on that I'm going to go back to. Um, let me see if I can find it, and uh, because. Um, was asked okay. earlier. I unmuted. Oh, great. Okay, Ed, ask ask away. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, my question basically is, these are great ideas and I have really interesting uh, concepts here, but there's a fundamental problem and to a large part in the, the, the private sector, and that is the urge to build a house on the shore and the the flood 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 protection, the basically the insurance, federal insurance in flood cases. And that if we can't if we don't address that in some way at a larger scale, there's gonna be continual pressure to build on the shore in, in, in areas that are gonna be damaged can be damaged. Um Ed, do you have a question with that or is this that a comment. It's a question. Uh, what, what are your thoughts? What are the panel's thoughts on that? How do you okay. keep? How, how do you modify? How can we work to modify the federal flood insurance so that people aren't encouraged to rebuild and create the same problem we've already had? Mm -hmm. I think we. Anybody um, want to answer that? Yeah, I think there's. I have two two part answer. One. Um, the city of Gloucester has is looking for a zoning change to uh, reduce the ability, or eliminate it in many cases, to expand or build new housing in FEMA flood zones. And <clears throat> this is uh, going to be controversial. People own land that hasn't been developed yet, and. Um, but Town Green has been enlisted to help build awareness as to why this is a good thing for the very reason that Ed Hand is pointing out. Um, secondly, um, I think that the just awareness of what the, the we're going to be doing some financial projection analysis with, with some national experts in the next year in the, in the 
ecological uh, restoration grant that Harvard will be beginning in January. And part of that will be involving looking at um, what's going to happen to the uh, financial markets as we begin the, the skyrocketing cost of ensuring vulnerable uh, properties will be a self-regulating thing. And it is, is I think as um, Charles was saying, people who are making individual choices will say, well, I can't rebuild if it's going to cost me five times what it used to cost me for mortgage insurance and you know flood insurance. Um, even when the city might allow it because it wants the, wants the income. <clears throat> Thanks, Dick. Um, we're trying to get just a few more questions in here. Um, Eric Hutchins, uh, you've had your hand up. Would you like to ask the panel a question? Yeah, it's kind of a comment, but I, I, for you to comment on, which wasn't touched on a lot, just, just dabbled on. And I think that, the, in my opinion, the big gorilla at Good Harbor Beach is the parking lot. Obviously, it's the road, but it's the parking lot. It's an economic engine, so it's going to kick in economics. Can it ever get a permit to be raised? I doubt it. Um, the projections on sea level rise, what's its longevity? So we start planning on what to do with Good Harbor Beach based on the future prospects of the parking lot. That's what needs to be thought about because that's a huge area of filled tidal wetlands and it's the area that the beach wants to migrate to. One of my earlier comments was, do you try to just keep it doing where it doesn't want to be? You can throw all the beach grass you want on there and throw sand on it. It wants to go inland and then where it wants to go is on the parking lot. So we have to address what nature wants to do there, not what we want or what cost are we gonna to do to keep it there. I, I, yeah. I got it. I, I agree completely with you, Eric. And I, um, yeah, that's where it wants to move. And I, I have a question for everybody. Does anyone know what the sand must go on to the parking lot now? And what ha what does the town do with the sand when they scrape it off to, um, you know, to open up the parking lot? Jane, um, does you it, want to take that? Yeah. Do, do you know? I, Jane? I don't know. I think they put it back on the beach. Back on the beach. Okay. Oh, that's a real yeah, important but, question. Uh, but yes, I, there, yeah. there is yeah. sand that goes on the parking lot regularly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where it wants to go. And I like the idea, sort of that, that adaptation pathway. What level does it have? <laughs> Oops. Oh, there. I Somehow I got muted, but I'm unmuted. So sorry. Um, uh, the, the adaptation pathway. So when is it that the parking lot will be flooded more often, like every high tide? And so oh. the, the community says, you know, we can't park our cars there. We can't spend any time on the beach or or how many storms? What What is that critical point where people say we don't want to be there anymore and we right. need well an option? It's coming soon. I mean, we've we've had the parking lot's been flooded for the last four days, mm -hmm. really. Parts of it, not the whole thing, mm -hmm. but parts of it just because it's an astronomical tide. So mm -hmm. I don't know what the rest of the panel or other people think about the idea of you know tearing up the parking lot and um, shuttling people to the beach. I don't know if people ever do that. Um, I don't know if that's an option. I think this is an excellent question for the uh, master plan of the city because yeah. it does involve economics and involves future, involves inevitable changes. And what we've heard from Barbara and everybody is that, you know, five to 10 year horizons are when you can start introducing things and then get them to be accepted. And, um, you know, if you said tomorrow, it's got to go tomorrow, I mean, there's no way. I mean, it's just not going to happen. We'll right. start, we'll start yeah. building awareness that it will have to happen. And if we do it this way, we'll, we'll lose less money and it will cost us less money. Mm -hmm. So losing Maybe. less and costing less are two things that change city managers' minds. Well, maybe this is something that we could bring up in our, our final workshop of the series. And I uh, just want to be respectful of time. We're at 829. And I just want to thank the panel for being with us and all of our speakers. 
for this evening's event. And thank you all for um, signing in to be with us. We had a great group um, online. If you have any other questions, you can get in uh, touch with me. I've put my email in the chat. I'd be happy to pass along any of your questions to um, the speakers. So we're just going to wrap up um, right now. Just a couple of announcements before we go. Uh, another mention of the January 23rd field trip to Good Harbor Beach that will be at 11.30 a.m. We will meet in the parking lot um, to take a look at, you know, the potential adaptation solutions that would be available. Uh, the last field trip was great, so I really uh, encourage people to come. Um, the last final workshop of the series will be in the spring. Uh, we'll have more information in the Town Green newsletter. You can go to our website, tomgreen2025.org, uh, for more information to sign up for our newsletter. Uh, and I hope that you will join us for a full year of programming next year when we will have similar workshops such as this series that will focus on Rockport, Manchester by the Sea, and Essex. Uh, if you have enjoyed this series so far with Good Harbor Beach, please consider making a donation on our website, again, towngreen2025.org, and please reply to a survey that you will be receiving um, about this presentation. We really like your feedback and to know what you enjoyed and what you think might can be what can be improved. Um, that's all we have for this evening. I thank you all again for joining us and have a lovely holiday season. Thank, Thank you, you and good night. Thank you. Thanks, Maureen. Thank you. Thank you for having me.